Hello to you all. Welcome to this Musée de la Vie Wallonne for this first conference that we are organizing among two big exhibitions here, Waste, Sorting Out and Upcycling. So this is the first conference that will look at issues linked to waste. So the first one today, we'll talk about uh, slow fashion and secondhand market. Is it a good solution? And for that, we invited Sandrine Kunson. And you will have the pleasure to meet her in a few minutes. The next conference is We'll talk about programmed obsolescence on the 20th of October, on the 26th of October, zero waste and future of nuclear waste on uh, 9th of December. And on the 2nd of March next year, we will talk about the future of industrial waste in Wallonia. So those themes are very broad, but we are all touched by them and affected by them. And this first conference is happening with a partnership with the House of European History and we are being filmed and recorded today and we are being uh, streamed live and we have a lot of listeners who are joining us today. And without further ado, I will give the word to Ava Salvador from the European House and she will talk a little bit about the partnership. Thank you very much, William. Hello to you all on the, on the behalf of the European History a house of European History in Brussels. I would like to uh, thank the Musée of the Walloon Life for organizing this partnership. It started two years ago together with 10 European museums in various cities. And in Belgium, we have our museum in Brussels and yours here in Liège. And this partnership works on the history of waste and it is called Throw Away project and in this landscape this conference is being web street on the um, house of european history website in french but also with uh, conference interpretations into english and so we are trying to touch a broader public so that they can listen and they also have the possibility to ask questions in the chat and william will uh, read those to us later and if this theme interests you, waste and environment, and if you want to uh, look at more conferences on top of the ones that William announced, there will also be at other conferences online uh, that will also be web streamed. So thank you very much for being here and I wish you a good conference. So today we are welcoming Sandrine Kunson. Sandrine studied the history of art and she worked for a long time on exhibitions and on the subject of heritage. And she also trained herself in sewing and fashion at the Académie des Beaux-Arts de Liège, among others. And following those training, she decided to get deeper into that subject, creating a brand, Sanona, with a rose pimpernel brand and she committed herself to the slow, 30, uh, slow 31 um, non-profit organization. We'll talk about it later. And she also uh, worked at the Helmo Higher Education School and she also was busy at the Saint-Luc uh, institution. So I will give the floor to Sandrine and after we've heard her, we also will have the possibility to receive some questions. Hello to you all. Thank you very much for joining us online or in person. I'm very happy to be here. So usually my audience is quite numerous. So I teach sometimes to over a hundred students. And however, despite that today, I'm feeling quite humble and I will be non-judgmental and I will try to answer this very broad question is the second hand a good solution? Does it meet the environmental issues and questions that we are asking ourselves? So first of all, of course, the first reflex is say yes, but, 
And yesterday evening, I was uh, eating at a restaurant with a friend and we were talking about Fanny Ardant, an actress, and she was um, talking about paradoxes in an article. There is like a bit of an energy when we are wondering, questioning ourselves. Sometimes there's a tendency to go a little bit too fast and to say things that are contradictory to themselves. And so I please, I hope that you will forgive me if I say several things and I present you several perspectives. I will try to present to you what this secondhand consumption is. I will present to you the history and then I will go into the yes, it's a solution, but. And then I would like to talk about the best practices and about potential solutions that are being developed in this world in transition that is ours today. So first of all, I thought it would be interesting to really reflect what do we talk about when we talk about fashion and secondhand. We talk about uh, fripe in French, which is like rags. And so from a history in the past, clothing, garments were tailor-made. They were being cherished by the owners. And so in the past, when someone had to change a garment, that person might become um, unhappy about it. And so the clothing used to be really used until the very end. And even then afterwards, tattered clothes or tattered fabric would be reused. And it's only later that we could see that this new clothing surproduction or ultra fast production was being developed so in the fast in the past tailor made uh, clothing would be um, repaired would be resewn would be really really cherished and loved and alterated and so there was um they were very useful and they were also matching a social evolution and the clothes clothes would also be given um, as a legacy or as a, as a heritage and we found notarial deeds that proved that some clothes were being given as a heritage to children so this is very different from what we find today in our wardrobes and today we don't have the same relationship to clothing and maybe one of the solution for clothing would be to give clothes and garments their good name again, like their good reputation and to find this love again to the clothes. So when do we start seeing secondhand clothes? So in the past, thrifting always existed. However, the second-hand markets can really be seen in the 19th of century in a Paris neighborhood called Le Carré du Temple. And there were four different hallways and one hallway was only for clothes. And so in that building, you could find small stands or small shops around clothes. And this Carreau du Temple will know famous periods and then less famous ones. And after the Second World War, there will be a last good period and then it started uh, disappearing. Until now, when we can see that secondhand is um, getting popular again. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to show you my slides. So here I give you a small quote to try to show you that today secondhand market is very big. So what he says, it means that it is knowing a growth rate uh, that is 20 times higher than the new market. And in the USA, they say that slow fashion or secondhand will um, be bigger than new fashion. And we can also see that the, this new secondhand market will have a value assessed at $36 billion of dollars in 2021, and it should double by next year. So this is quite scary, but at the same time, it is also some optimism. And we might be, have a tendency to think that it is a good solution. 
So here's some pictures about Le Carreau du Temple. You can see some ladies there. And they're going from stand to stand and they are thrifting. Um, also thrifting underwear, looking for shoes. And if you look at the history of clothing, there are several turning points and they slowly led us to an overconsumption. First turning point is the Industrial Revolution. So um, textile is being uh, processed. So we are in Belgium here. So maybe you knew, you know, the movie uh, Dance, which is talking about this industry at the end of the 19th century in Belgium. And this industrial revolution will slowly produce or lead us to fast fashion. But there are two other turning points. So which is the ready to wear which appears in the US in the 20s, in the 30s, and then there's a big boom in the 40s. And the United States are using the world war to develop their own economy, and they will implement this ready-to-wear system. Ready-to-wear will come to France. However, haute couture in France does not like ready-to-wear, except for Yves Saint Laurent, who will rebounds on it and will develop Rive Gauche, his own uh, ready-to-wear brand. However, at the start, at the outset, the French people did not like ready-to-wear. It's only later that it will gain momentum. And for me, that's a switch for me, a turning point. So that means that in the past, people were used to thrifting, but with ready-to-wear, those people will think, okay, I don't need tailor-made clothing anymore. I can buy new garments, new ready-to-wear, and they don't need to um, adjust or alter them. And in the 90s, it exploded. So I remember the, the, apparition, the appearance of H-E-M and Super Confex. My mom would take us there, Super Confex. And she found it very practical in her case, she would inherit clothes from her cousin. And for me, that was also the case. I would use clothes from my cousins. And this used to be a tradition, but it changed. And we felt a bit of um, the rise of freedom. So there was a woman, these women started to work, and they were able to buy new clothes for their children. And so there was this new tendency that was appearing. And so for me, those, those switches those turning points will um, slow down the second hand. However, that does not mean that second hand will disappear. We still find second hand, but second hand is chosen because of a trend, because of how it looks. And this is what will make it more popular slowly again. So we have fast fashion made in Europe. So at the beginning, H&M, for example, would produce in Europe. And then textile industry will become more and more toxic because of delocalization. So the manufacturing and the, will be delocalized. And today, some clothes will produce garments in 48 hours. So we are in the midst of ultra-fast fashion. And that comes with a whole series of problems that are linked to the possibility, what makes it possible to produce a garment in 48 hours. So I would like to draw your attention to this here. So new garments pollute, but they're not the only ones who pollute. Second hand also pollutes. This is why I say, yes, it's a solution, but because I would like to draw your attention to the fact that even though secondhand is not polluting because of um, manufacturing, washing them and sending them off also pollutes. And this is not taken into account by secondhand uh, sales platforms. So here we have a small graph and we can see the various ratio of pollutions. So thrifters will have tips and tricks. They will tell you to use vodka watered down with spray, which can 
help you avoid having to wash clothes with water. They will also tell you that you can wear jeans seven times without washing them. Because every time you wash a piece of clothing, it has a huge impact on the environment. So today, why do we use second hand? Why do we buy second hand? Because of monetary reasons, because it is a trend, because it gives you a certain identity. And then the new thing, what is new for our generation, because we have an environmental mindset. So yes. So yes, it is a solution. However, we should define exactly what we mean by second hand. So we have the thrift stores, uh, professionals, that's in the real life, all virtual uh, platforms. And here I'd like to develop further uh, different argument. First, I would like to cite uh, Catherine Doriac, who says we have manufactured enough garment to dress the entire planet up to 2,100. So hence the questions of second hands. What do we need exactly? What, what we need is already manufactured. So how can we use it? What's our action? And, the action uh, we choose to make are interesting. So indeed, secondhand stores and beyond, we also have a but. And là, uh, des, en France, il y a Emmaüs. En Belgique, on a Terre, ASBL, on a Leptirien. Uh, tout, tout, cette, tout ce système uh, repose sur le fait qu'on nous on recycle bien nos vêtements. Et alors là, c'est un vaste sujet. Je pourrais faire toute une conférence sur rien que le fait de, de quel geste, comment trier ses vêtements et comment on peut... So, of course, this is a very interesting subject. And then, next to this physical stand that are helping social economy, we have platforms. And the most... Uh, Famous one is Vinted. And today, Vinted, we are talking about addiction, about the scrolling addiction. There is a practice which is called scalping, which is a practice. You buy new clothes and then you resell them at a higher price. And so some people use Vinted um, and earn their money with that. So Vinted uh, created a, a big change because it provided um, everyone the possibility to purchase second held. So it's Vinted played a wide role because I, as I explained earlier, um, only the noblemen, the rich, had the means to uh, to sew garments, and we even uh, paid servants or or, uh, or uh, staff with clothes. But now vintage changed the the situation a lot. Um, however. This led to overconsumption. Overconsumption for me is at the core of the issue here. If we have to choose between overconsuming new clothing or overconsuming secondhand uh, garment, for me, there's not much difference. We have to understand that, that at some point, our garments become trash and we need to postpone that status. We need to try and keep our uh, clothes for a long time. So today we are faced by a massive uh, influx of second-hand clothes and in my wardrobe I constantly need to assess the uh, quality of clothing that can be sold or not. And the situation is the same for 
second-hand uh, shops, they need to sort out uh, the low quality items and we call it throw away. More about the vintage platform, but each time I can cite a positive point and counter it with a negative point. For instance, where we're talking about over-consuming, indeed, Stephanie Calvino mentions fast fashions of the second hand. Yes, however, this is uh, an economy that is direct from people to people. You don't have any intermediaries. Therefore, the, it's a micro-economy between micro dealings between individual however the system uh, is not micro at least it's huge and uh, it takes time it's time consuming it's energy consuming and i'd like to mention a thesis a wonderful thesis from uh, coralie uh, mora uh, coralie meluart and um, i had the chance to discuss with her and she told me you know sandrine if you bring your vintage parcel, you driving your car and uh, drop it to a, a, a shipping point. Well, the advantage of on the environment, the fact that you bought second hand, well, it has been uh, countered by the fact that you had to drive your car. So indeed, you sometimes we try to do the right thing, and it's not the case. So we have to think a bit wider, beyond. And Coralie, what does she says in her thesis, um, she says we have to see the, to compare uh, the sale of the, the items and the effect it has on, on the environment. Therefore, she encourages us to see what use we have from the purchased garment. Uh, now we have garment libraries or uh, swap shops where you can exchange uh, clothes. And I have uh, created a few of these stores myself. To come back to Vinted, we have some downsides, abuses. But on the other hand, I'd like to say that if someone goes to a flea market and try and find the best item, and you know these markets, and she's saving, or these people, they are, they are saving clothes that are just displayed on the ground, uh, on the carpet. And to me, those who take the time to rediscover all the clothes and they take the time to go to those flea markets and sell back, sell them back to vintage, I find some added value in this behavior because they're saving and they're postponing the death of the of the uh, garment. So that's a um, a positive point, but of course, some professionals use vintage the other way. What we can do, I know in Belgium, um, there will be some changes in uh, the taxation. So anyone who is earning over 2000 euros on the vintage platform will have to pay tax on these revenues. So that's one way that the government is trying to cadenas the abuses and um, excesses that we have observed on vintage. To go uh, further, the solution I'd like to suggest is to go with a, a concept called look at the cost per wear. Each time you purchase a garment, look for quality, but also try and think what's the use of this purchase. Just ask yourself how many times will I wear this garment if this is something you're going to wear every day and if you think that yes i will put the right price to purchase such garment so you have to divide the price by the number of time you're going to wear it 
And you can apply the same concept to fast fashion because they have programmed obsolescence in them. We are we talking about fridges or microwaves for that. Rarely do we mention this for government, but it is the case. If you buy a fast fashion t-shirt at five euros, but you can't wear it many times because very soon it's not looking good. Do apply the concept. Perhaps the price, even if it's five euros, will be too high for you, for the planet. And with this in mind, you can find quality items in second hand. I know some people are against the gentrification of vintage. It used to be available and affordable uh, and it's becoming more expensive, but I still we can I still think we can find that it is possible to look for quality items. And uh, how do we know if it's a quality item or not? Well, you have to feel it to touch the material. And we indeed do need to take time and devote time to that. And also read the label. Uh, Okay, you're going to tell me, well, on Invented it's not possible, but if you go on uh, physical stores, try and see um, the material. Is it uh, synthetic? Is it easy to wash? Uh, um, wool, linen, these are environmental material that you can buy secondhand or new. Well, these are some examples of um, best practices that I would like to suggest and also to reflect on and project yourselves before you buy. And uh, very bri- briefly, I'd like to mention my project, uh, Swap Shop Slow 31. Marie Lovenberg and I decided to create something that would help us think a platform for dialogue and uh, we directly thought about slow fashion the opposite of fast fashion Uh, we draw a pyramid or we found a pyramid ready made but we we really adopted it to our purposes and we created workshops uh, events as you can see on the pyramid, it's to take care of what you already own. Go to alterations, mend, repair, uh, take care of, of your garments and try and try and sew yourself. We have forgotten many skills. It's time to learn again. That was the first layer of our pyramid. Uh, number two, it's to swap garments uh, we have open stores where you can just uh, swap your uh, clothes they are assessed according to a few criteria, uh, including quality the material etc uh, so these are shared world worlds we have about 400 people exchanging and swapping clothes like that. We are based in Liège, but I know that this is very um, on the rise in other places. So I hope that this will increase even further. And as Coralie uh, Meira, I'm convinced that this is our future. To create more closest library so you simply hire your garment and not purchase it so we have a shift in paradigm creating common a common wardrobe and not an individual wardrobe something you can share and swap thank you so these are some um resources I'd like to share with you. You will find here a link to uh, Coralie's thesis and uh, some articles that I have used 
And finally, the Bible for me that I use in the lecture I provide, where you can have uh, thorough definitions of thrift shops and you can find a very complete history of the of our clothes. Thank, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, I'm here to listen to them. Thank you so much, Sandrine. I do have many questions, but uh, let us first ask the audience. Dear participants, if you have questions, raise your hands. We'll bring the mic to you. Just a second. Yes, the mic so that it's recorded. You mentioned the period in history that the industrialization of clothing. I would like to highlight that uh, women were deprived of their skills. They, they lost their skills during that period. Uh, we used to be able to sew, to mend, to alter uh, clothing. And to me, it's a shame that we, we have lost those skills. How, how, can they, how can we bring them back? Very uh, excellent question. Thank you very much. The garment um, professions did not only con affect women. We had many men, um, uh, tailors, were men, and those who worked leather, they were men as well. We, you have the same in. Uh, haute couture, mostly men. It's true that the uh, smaller jobs for mending and repairing, that affected women more, indeed. And as you are pointing it uh, very uh, precisely, after the 50s, women go back to their household and that coincides with the ready to wear um, and women in general, emancipation, so we, we are in the midst of this period, women won't have time to to sew and to do all they used to do. Of course, at school, you still learn some skills, basic skills, but today they don't have sewing uh, classes anymore. Lately we visited school and we provided a lecture combined with a workshop. We asked the students to bring a garment to be mended and some discovered how to, to sew basic, really basic um, uh, skills. Therefore, it is an education issue as well. It is true that clothes were less appreciated. So if you do not um, consider clothes as something important, well, you lose all the skills that are uh, surrounding it for its maintenance, for its repair. And that, that, that led us to the area of throwaway. One of the key would be to reappropriate the, these lost skills by women, but also by men. Uh, and that's in, an interesting point. It is not, we cannot divide this, it is not clustered. Uh, and what is nice is that men and women, everyone is uh, interested in recovering those skills. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. To follow up on uh, what has been said, well, I'm 58. I remember in primary school, we had to learn how to knit, how to sew. Uh, only girls and um, boys, well, boys had intellectuals, intellectual games to do uh, chess or anything else. So it was very frustrating uh, to me that we had the sewing lesson and boys had the interesting stuff to do. Uh, today, I feel emancipated. Uh, to me, it's a change that today we don't have those sewing classes any longer for girls and that today girls 
can also do something interesting. Well, the idea was that it's for everyone and we don't need to discriminate and discern it, uh, girls and boys. And of, of course, at school, we were just um, taught to do this and that without explanation. We didn't know why it's important to be able to mend a garment. Thank you. It's very really interesting. This is very interesting because today when we ask children to take a jeans from home and we teach them sewing, not in an imposing it onto them, but through games and they are making something and they are learning and we explain to them why it is interesting to reuse an old jeans because manufacturing a jeans nowadays it means liters and liters of water. I think it's also f over 40,000 kilometers that the jeans has to travel before it lands in a shop here in Europe. And we try to explain what is the value of knowing how to sew and how to thread a needle because unfortunately today we are throwing away pieces of clothing where there is a button missing. And why is this garment being thrown away? Just because it is ready to throw away garment. And so for me, I don't see the utility to repair it. And so it is, I'm not trying to blame, but I am coming back to what I was saying at the start. We need to give clothing and clothes their reputation, their fame again, their good name. And we want to multiply workshops, repair workshops. We want to infuse a new life into textile jobs, taking into account today's circumstances and labor conditions. So, however, we, we, we know we're not going to work the same way here as um, some people are working in other countries. I'm telling you a story about an engineer, and he was talking about mines mines in Europe, if we had to reopen mines here in Europe to extract those rare ores, we would understand better what are the conditions, the labor conditions that are necessary and how different they are from those practiced abroad. Another question. I was a little bit wondering, you were talking about repairing, alterating clothes. And I was wondering if there was also a reflection about how to maintain and how to wash differently, which other products we can use. We know that in hotels, for example, they ask you to uh, not uh, throw the towels on the, on the ground every day so they don't have to change them every day. And so we see that there is a reflection going on. What about the washing products? Is there a reflection on that? Are there new products available to wash clothing? So because the soaps and stuff are also very polluting. So the most toxic for clothes are the softeners because they are fatty products and they saturate the textile, the fabric. And so they are good practices. The first of all, try to limit the number of washes. Our grandmothers would do it differently. Or so, for example, if you come back from a party, you can you can see you can smell the the, the clothes have a certain smell, and it is possible to not wash it in a washing machine. So that's the first thing. And then when you use a product. Use a basic one like a Marseille soap, for example. It's the most basic soap there is. And use also um, a few drops of essential oil and then add some vinegar so you can soften the fabric. And you have to go back to simplicity. And sim simple is efficient. And this is what is going to respect the fabric the most. I hope I answered your question. Are there any other questions? Thank you. I was wondering what was the environmental impact of sewing? 
as opposed to buying new clothes? What when you create your clothes from scratch? That's a very good question. I made a bit of an experiment and compared it to the real cost of a garment, I couldn't really analyze the whole life cycle, but there are some studies that are starting to be conducted in Gram and at Elmo, where I teach, some researchers are studying the life cycle and the impact at every step of the manufacturing pro uh, process. So when you create the clothes yourself, you can control the impact you have much better. So that's already very positive. Of course, if you want to uh, look at the details, you can choose the materials, try to use better labels. The label GOTS and GODEX, for example. GOTS is the best one, G-O-T-E-S. Next to that, there are also threads that are also GOTS labeled, which is a good one to choose. But next to that, if you want to create a t-shirt and if you calculate the cost, it can cost you between 35 and 50 euros a piece because you take into account the time it takes you to create it. So the labor, so this is actually what you pay in real life for a good quality t-shirt. So there is a whole reflection. You can think about your habits, your consumption, purchasing habits. So is it a good solution to purchase five low quality t-shirts? No, it's better to choose a more ethically produced t-shirt like EcoStore, for example, and I also encourage the elaboration or the drafting up of a charter to explain how to maintain the clothes. So there are a lot of possibilities and reflections to do. And so one of the things to do is I will not purchase five low quality t-shirts because when I add those on top of each other, they will cost more than one good quality t-shirt. But are we ready for that? Are we ready for degrowth? Are we ready to consume less? And that's also at the heart of the problems is this consumption trend. And if we look for an alternative solution like Vinted, but if we still over consume on Vinted, we are actually not um, implementing a good solution. So I'm coming back to what you were saying online question and they're asking what is the role of the political level do they have a role to play yes at the european level a lot of things are happening i'm really not um, able to present to you the details of, of what is happening at the european level but there are uh, there is a legislation there are official documents and there is also um, new requirements that will be imposed on textile industries, requirements when it comes to transparency, when it comes to waste, when it comes to obsolescence. So things are moving and they need to move. They need to move at the macro and at the micro level. So that means if Europe um, drafts up directives, but nothing changes at the local um, national level, it won't help. And then local initiatives, they will only really gain momentum if there is also some support coming from above. So the macro and the micro levels need to work hand in hand. So if you ban something, so in France, for example, a few years ago, they forbade the destruction of uh, new clothes stocks because in the past, some stocks were being destroyed. So that became, um, that that was banned. But what happened, the destruction got delocalized. So those stocks were then sent abroad to be destroyed. So we need both European level decisions and we need local support, local initiatives. I hope I answered the question. Another question. Would you 
recommend a documentary on fast fashion. There are a lot of those. The two cost of fashion, for example, is the one that had the biggest impact on me. So the true cost of fashion is the title of this documentary. And it's really excellent. There is also La Vie d'une Petite Culotte, the life of a panties, pair of panties. And I think it's a filmmaker from Liège. And she started from the her mother's shop. And I had an exchange with one of the cultural centers where this movie, where this documentary was shown in 2020 during the COVID times. And it's also really nice. Lots of interesting things also. An Ashakt movie happening in uh, England. And there, there is a factory in which women, 85 to 95% of women labor working in factory for um, brands like Boohoo, for example. And they earn about seven pounds an hour, no social security. And this is like in a kind of England's no man's land. Um, so this documentary, for example, it was like a hit in the face. I lived in England and it's really hard for me to comprehend or understand or think about those neglected, abandoned factory buildings, that there are some women who are still working in horrible conditions. We still have the impression that, that these sweatshops only happen or exist very far away from us, but that's not the case. You can find some in England. I also had a question. You were talking about the importance of touching the textile to apprehend the quality. And you also said something. There are some ideas or bias about the uh, quality or the, um, the life expectancy of clothes. So people still think that made in China is bad. However, made in Italy would be good and a luxurious product. But it's not always the case. So again, there are a lot of nuances. So today there is a trend which is the made in Europe trend because people are becoming more aware. So you go and you look at the label and you might think, oh, this is made in China. This is probably bad quality. This is what I would also believe in the past. And you can see those evolve. And I discovered that a garment's label is not always reflecting what's happening. So, for example, you can put Made in Italy on a piece of clothing when only the buttons were attached to the clothes in Made in Italy. And yes, there is this trend. We think it's politically correct to buy Made in Italy clothing. However, there are some things happening in Portugal or in Eastern Europe where there are some sweatshops. So. That's why it's important to work together with ethical brands who have a clear charter. And for me, the solution would be transparency. If there is a brand that you like, ask questions, make some searches on internet. If it looks shady and there's not a lot of transparency, it's probably that they're not really clear about themselves. And about the Made in China, today we have two issues, according to me. So we have one problem of the Uyghur minority. They are imprisoned, they are working in camps, and they have to make clothes. So for example, Lacoste brand decided not to produce Made in China clothes, as long as there would not be a solution offered to protect that ethnic minority. And then another issue, let's not forget that China developed very strong manufacturing capacities, but also strong 
textile know-how. And so we go to China today, not only to look for cheap made in China, but sometimes there are some um, sewing workshops in China that have a very high skilled labor. And so there are several aspects. And this shows how complex the reality is. So once you start wondering and questioning, for me, that's the first main step towards conscious purchases. Now you were talking about transparency. Another question, could you maybe go into details into how does Fintech work? What's the energy consumption impact? What's What about emissions? What is the impact? Is it only local or is it also um, broader? Vinted works on three pillars. You have Spain, Benelux, so Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, Spain. So you have like this axis, this region. So there's lots of vinted packages. I was looking at the number of packages being sent around. I thought I read about billions. I'm not, I'm not quite sure anymore, but it's 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 huge. So the environmental impact is huge too, due to packaging among others. I don't have specific numbers, but if you think about, if you think that you are going to walk or use your 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 bike to pick up your package, that's better. But if you look. You have to think about your packaging. You can use cardboard or if you can use paper to protect the, the, the clothes, it also has a different impact. So I'm not going to stop buying on Vinted. I have a 14 year old boy. He needs specific types of clothing. When I don't find those garments on Chez Terre or in my barter shop, I will look for what he wants or for this specific piece of clothing on Vinted. I don't scroll. I'm not shopping online, but I'm looking for something very specific like pants or shirt. And it's always about thinking. It's the overconsumption that is bad for the carbon footprint, for the waste produced. But if you are going about it in a conscious manner, if you go about it smartly, then I think using Vinted can also limit your impact. I'm not quite sure I answered the question. It's the word waste that made me react it. I went and I bought... Um, like bags to protect some piece of clothing in the washing machine. And I was thinking I could just use an old t-shirt to do that. And so this reflection thinking I can just reuse something I already have. It's a bit of a pity that it we don't think more. They are really simple gestures that we can implement. And why can't we find tips and tricks in textile stores, for example, to avoid having more waste? So, for example, I could use an old um, jacket to, to make a, a bag. So there are many possibilities to transform and upcycle. Lots of garments are being are tattered and we choose to throw them away, but we can make a different choice. However, we need inspiration to find a solution. So yes, this is a challenge. But nowadays, the good thing is that the homemade is becoming more and more trendy again. Not only when it comes to uh, textile and clothes, but in a lot of different domains. So what you're talking about is really upcycling. It's, it's giving a new added value to something that was already existing and you transform it. So it's not recycling, it's upcycling. And this has been existing since the Middle Ages. We found old text about somebody who was 
um, transforming old garments in um, in a pouch, for example. And why did that disappear? Because of ultra liberalism because we were given the possibility to live in a consumption society where we just purchase what we need and we're not thinking about, could I make it myself? No, I can find it in the store, so I'm just going to buy it. So it comes from the golden 60s, from the 70s. So maybe we should blame our parents a little bit and say it's their fault. But but I do teach future designers and I decided to work with them on the what is remaining. As an industrial designer, how do you use the leftovers? What can I do with them? What can I do with those? Do I use them in my reflection of um, as, a, as a designer, as a creator? And it's the same for fashion designers. So a lot of them are going to use a zero waste pattern. So it's a new technique. So zero waste pattern. The idea being that you are creating the design, you are modeling your garment without um, with a less waste uh, possible. So they are working with uh, professionals, the modelists, aiming at having a zero waste to use as much textile material as possible. From And others will use the wasted piece in order to create new items. So that's very trendy as well. Another idea is to explain on the label, explain the price, why the does it costs such and such. Uh, that's communication, that's uh, raising awareness, and that's uh, moving towards more uh, transparency. You mentioned sewing. Uh, I, as a in creator, uh, as the author of, of, a, of a garment, I spent so many hours uh, designing the garment. I went to a... Um, a shop to have it manufactured uh, that cost me so much and uh, I need some extra money to be able to make a living out of it so if you describe it on your label that's that's more information to your uh, client to your customer you mentioned the use of uh, clothes to you encourage us to think of the using and here i have an example for a uh, wedding dresses so that's cool. that's an example of a garment that you wear only once that is expensive uh, that entails a lot of uh, textile so perhaps can we just hire such garments uh, would that be better indeed we have some uh, hiring hiring shop for cocktail dresses and i see an increasing demand in wedding dresses higher so the reflection is already present indeed it might be that we are emotionally uh, linked to this particular piece. Uh, another great idea is to use the wedding dress of your mother or your grandmother of someone that is dear to you and alter it, alter it if, and hem it if necessary. But it is true that one characteristic of a garment is that it is highly personal. It is emotional. Um, not perhaps all the items of your wardrobe that you could exchange or swap with anyone or renew without being attached to it. But then you have those particular pieces of garment, a dress. It can be a wedding dress. It can be a shirt, uh, the shirt you were wearing uh, at graduation time or something that reminds you of your identity of, or part of your history. And this is important this aspect of cl closing because that might trigger back some value that we can put in our clothes. Thank you. We are drawing to the end of our conference. Do you have a final comments or questions? 
you mentioned emotions and uh, I would like to emphasize the notion of overconsumption because overconsumption is a natural compensation for something that is lacking so sometimes we we buy more to fill something that is missing within us and we might reflect on why do we overconsume clothes and to me uh, a garment is linked to all these uh, a pleasure to excitement to something emotional around uh, purchasing the um, the item so there is a psychology dimension to us purchasing too many uh, clothes thank you for your comments i believe that our, our behavior are well covered they are studied by marketers by big brands and these brands what they do best is to uh, provoke uh, the need to attract us, the attractiveness they are in the windows, the smell in the shops, the, everything is made to attract customers, to make you purchase. So they play on emotion very professionally. And we have also Instagram, which is feeding us a constant desire of obtaining such and such uh, clothes to look like those um, Instagram individuals so, and we do need to resist that is not easy to resist to such um, such a call a, a massive a constant um, effort and so we feel when we are in a shop i need to get some uh, pleasure out of purchasing a nice item of clothes i might swap garment there and here but we have to resist to those marketing uh, efforts by our own reflections of investing in our happiness, investing in our well-being by purchasing some garment. I put some money into something, a clothes or an item, because I know that it will stay for a long time with me. It will have several lives. Uh, so. I am not against um, the fact that we'll go and have some pleasure in, in buying clothes. Uh, we are past that period where we went to H&M and went out with three huge bags of cheap clothes. This is gone. Now the quantity has been shifted to quality. What's important is to be happy with your your piece of item, your garment, and have a, a very long and happy life with your clothes. I hope this feeds into your reflection. Yes, we do work on our mindsets. We do need to work on our conscience. We need to raise awareness about this topic because psychologically, psychologically these are compulsive purchases that are that trigger immediate pleasures which disappears practically instantly instant a few instants later sorry we do need, do need to include the psychological dimension into our behavior uh, we do have a great concept uh, by a shakt they launch a concept and they call it the consumer actor meaning that each of us as a consumer we need to become an actor so to, to, to reflect on our behavior um, and not do things impulsively uh, and there are a wide array of methods uh, today the online shopping makes makes it even more difficult however you should never validate your your purchase 
on the spot. You leave it for some time or overnight and, and then go back to it and see if you really need to buy everything that you have put in your basket. And that's how you can really become an actor. You can really drive your purchases and not um, be a victim of compulsive purchase. Thank you. I was looking up on uh, other methods of being uh, more choosing. Perhaps we should choose more basic and neutral uh, clothes and there there might be a risk of of uh, having clothes that are dull and uh, not fashionable anymore i don't think so thank you because i'm, I'm a teacher in in the fashion uh, industry and in uh, at schools something we need to know is that tomorrow's fashion will be hybrids we have today there are engineers uh, researchers that are inventing new material, new textiles that will have a lesser impact on the planet. We often hear that y you should only buy linen or wool and uh, then you will lose on the variety and on the beauty of fashions. But today we are working on uh, uh, leathers from, from fish or tensels or new materials. This is a new area. We are really in a transition. We often talk about the transition for the food industry, but here in the garment industry, we are in this transition held by new technology, discoveries, progress. And to me, tomorrow's fashion is hybrid, so it will not be dull. Uh, don't worry about it. You can mix so many textiles, some old, natural, high-tech textiles, I'm very optimistic. I love uh, clothing and I'm sure that we will invent more skills in the textile industry in the future. However, we will need to mainstream some items, uh, learn skills that we had lost in the past. And uh, something that is important is, to, uh, is education. And the very last question before we close the conference. It's an online question. Second hand is a new revenue for uh, everyone. Do you see there a risk in uh, transparency? Could you repeat it? Yes. The second hand provides an opportunity to earn money, but isn't there a risk like in to, for fast fashion to have to lose uh, transparency and um, to have to go against the environment indeed ideally we should uh, labelize second hands and to have a better tracking of second hand goods that would be ideal in social economy we have local um, local shops, so it's quite easy to track what what kind of clothes comes uh, in Wallonia. It's very, very close; it's local. However, I do also see that sometimes we purchase stocks of second-hand clothes, and we do not know where they come from. These clothes. And that adds some risks. For instance, today we still do ship second-hand clothes to Africa. It is sorted there. What they don't need ends up in piles of waste. And the problem is that after it is again shipped back to European second-hand and thrift stores or American thrift stores. And that's a problem. So the 
skill, the profession of adding value to um, government. This is real, um, real skills. We need to do it here and not delegate it to African countries for them to send it back to us. But uh, at this stage, it is not uh, regulated. We, it is not labelized. Uh, sourcing and resourcing need to be more um, labelized. We need to be able to say our second-hand clothes are sourced from local places. That would be ideal if you could say that, but at this stage it's not possible. Thank you so much, uh, Sandrine. This is the end of the conference. Don't hesitate to go and see our two exhibitions. I hope you enjoyed this session and I look forward to see you soon. Thank you very much.